Anybody else have any comments? Or? Mr. Dodds, go over it with your fine tooth comb. I, I did not. All right. No, sorry. I wasn't here, so I was going to just abstain from yep. commenting. That makes sense. You got me. All right. Do we have a motion? <coughs> Make a motion to accept the minutes as corrected. Mm -hmm. There's a motion to accept the minutes as corrected. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Abstain? Abstain, yeah. One, one abstention. And I'm sorry, I was looking down when the second came in. Is that Chip and Harry? You seconded? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, next order of business is public comment. I don't believe there's any public comment unless, Ms. Fontaine, you wanted to say anything? No, okay. Um, next item is conditional use permits. Uh, item A, Packies Investment LLC is seeking a conditional use permit for 12,235 square feet, <coughs> excuse me, of impact for the repairing and wetland buffer as a part of the com commercial development on property located at 363 Route 108 in the Commercial Industrial District, Assessor's Map 48, Lot 22B, CUP 14, 2022. Um, that applicant has requested to continue until next month. Um, I was wondering whether anyone was interested in a site walk, just because it's been, this application was originally opened in November. Yeah, that would be. The only question I've had on this is that this is his second go around with us after having this an original project jump over here, go direct to the planning board, and then be withdrawn from there at the applicant's request. He's now asked for a continuance, I think, is this three or four times mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. At what point do we stop continuing him and just drop this? I think that your regs say something about needing the applicant in attendance to review your application, or your um, rules of procedure may say that. Um, there's no public hearing on the aspect at this point, so it just continues on the agenda. Similar to like when the works, when they had that trail and that was mm -hmm. ongoing for about a year or so, and then it kind of dropped off. Um, we can relay to I can relay to them that you guys are concerned about how long this is taking and inquire if August will present an it. applicant before you um, and indicate that that is something that you would really like to see even would you want them to so they have been working on that vegetation management plan I believe okay would you want them to come in to just provide a verbal update on that? Should they as still not have that prepared? As long as they're moving forward with addressing the concerns that were raised and moving this application forward, I'm okay. I just was, I didn't realize there was anything going on there and didn't want this just sitting on our agenda repetitively getting continued for no action on the applicant's part. Yep, that yeah, was I'm, the not, I'm not sure it's worth their time or, or yeah. time maybe okay. for them to come in unofficially. If okay. they're moving. Yep. The moving. last indication was that they were still working on getting a complete vegetation management plan okay. for you guys for, as part of their application to have the most complete visit here before the board. Um, okay. So. Are they, <coughs> excuse me, are they going to be sending in a new application? Uh, the one we're looking at now is still from back in, I don't know what it was, February, March, April. And it still says their impact was 12,000 square feet, when in fact it was like 25,000 square feet. Uh, and so we're, we're working with documents that are four months old. It, it, it would be unfortunate if this entered the books that way, has that much impact when it's in fact more. Because then, it, you know, when we go back to look at mm -hmm. what's been done, we want to make sure it's accurate. Okay, yep. Given the, the time lag that we've got here, yeah, a new complete packet would probably be appreciated. Okay, I can, um, if you want to put that as part of your continuance motion that you want an, for a full submittal or a complete application resubmitted yeah. for at their next, the next time they come to the board. Yeah. Just so, and plus you guys have had to keep carrying them back and forth. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking them to 
give us a new packet now if they're not ready to actually Once they're bring ready. this up. Okay. When they're ready, yeah. Okay. So um, if we entertain a motion for a site walk, would you reach out to them asking for possible dates or do you want us to do it the other way around? Give you some possible dates? Let's do both. If you guys can give me a few dates that work for you, I can run those by them and then have their feedback and then we can I will let you know what day works the most solidly. Uh, do you want to see if you can get the veg management plan first before the site walk? I think my, my idea for the site walk was just not having eyes on what's going on there. And I'm not sure how sure how much longer we're going to continue. Okay. But yeah, ideally we would have that in, in hand. Maybe do another one. I don't know. Okay. What do you think? Would we want to get a report back from them on when they think they're actually going to be ready, and if it's like September, get in the site walk at that point, rather than you know go now and then find out that they're yeah <clears throat> maybe hold off for a, for a month. Okay. Maybe if you could ask them about the where they're at with the veg management plan. Yeah. Yeah, because if they're close, yeah. let's just do it when we've got all the, the, the documentation. Okay, so uh, motion to continue to next month, the uh, August, whatever date that would be in August meeting of the Conservation Commission, um, with a request to the applicant for an update on their progress um, and for a new packet when they are ready to actually come before us. I'll second. It's the ninth. Ninth, thank you. Okay, there's a motion and a second to continue till next month with a request to the applicant for an updated packet and um, a site walk to be scheduled when they're ready with a complete plan if it's in. Yeah, <clears throat> and a, um, an estimate for when the plan will be ready. Does that get it right? Yep. All right. Um, I guess I'll call names. Uh, Mr. Breyer? Yes. Mr. Rhodes? Yes. Ms. Smith Kenyon? Yes. Mr. Degler? Yes. Mr. Dodds? Yes. All right, and I vote yes. So the motion is passed. And when you're ready, we'll move on to the next ready. item. Okay. This is the uh, item B. Michael Davis is seeking a conditional use permit for after the fact excavation and alterations within the riparian and wetlands buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road in the residential single family district. Assessor's map 31, lot 49, CUP 3, 2023. This applicant has also requested to continue till next month. Um, and I don't believe there's any plan available. We received one plan. It's too large for me to make copies for to distribute for you all. Um, we don't have a large copier. Um, so as you included in your packet was a list of items that I have requested from the applicant, including one of those to be plans to be able to share with you all. Um, if there's anything else that at this point is outside of that list that would be beneficial that you feel as part of your review process, if you want to c include that in the motion for your continuance, um, that would be appropriate, I think. Can you also, I hate to put you on the spot, but could you also characterize the what's being requested of the commission in terms of remediation, et cetera? Um, so it's part of the court order that the applicant receive a conditional use permit for the work that has been done. Um, from my understanding, there has been um, significant work within the buffer area around there's a pond on his property. Um, I can find out further clarification of what the intent and the goal is. The applicant was rather vague too in what he supplied for his goal of his conditional use permit. Um, but it, 
likely it would be either some sort of restoration or confirmation of the work that was done that says, oh, okay, yes, that was fine, and here's your approval for it, even though it's already done. Um, but I can further clarify and provide further guidance for you all at the next meeting, um, hopefully with additional documentation. Was off-site mitigation on the table at all? Not that I'm aware of, but I can find out. I had a question about whether or not it was possible to get updated information from um, this really good summary about the things that had gone on with the property um, only went to June 18th of 2019. Is there any? There's two of those. Sorry, they're in two different formats. I apologize about that. So one of them, the prior code compliance officer had put together. Um, and then there is one that I added that indicates information regarding um, the um, a bit of the old code compliance officer and our current code compliance officers work with them um, through the different court cases and references the DES communication. Okay, so from June um, 18th, 2019 to March of 2022, nothing had been there was a bit of a gap. Um, it was the understanding of city staff, I believe, that DES was going to the Attorney General's office based off of communication provided by David Price. Um, and then it started up again. I believe we received some complaints from neighbors, um, which brought it to the attention of the city again and reactivated our um, efforts to have the property come into compliance. Alrighty, thank you. Do all of the items that were listed, complaints against him and uh, items that they wanted corrected, do those have to be um, corrected before he can get a conditional use permit? No, he needs a plan. Um, well, he's had, I mean, <laughs> he's had plans and right. more plans and more plans. and. Yeah. I think one of the options is that they could I think one of the options obviously would be you could say this was this is okay and you approve it and then he has an after the fact permit for what was done. There's the option of requiring him to restore the site to some level um, potentially. By but X time. Yeah, so I will get clarification on to confirm if those are the routes that and options for what you are looking at. I'll talk with Michelle about it. And is the AG still involved with this, do you know? I don't know. I don't know if okay. it made it. That's the DES. DES is, I think, some involved in it. They sent communication. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have anything based off um, outside of 2022. Okay. They may have sent something again in 2023, and I may have missed it. Okay. Um, there's a, there was a court order in 2011 August um, mm -hmm. with what they ordered so wouldn't um, whatever he does whatever he provides to us should include those things because it's a court order I would assume for the I think the 2011 was us as well the city yeah, of there summers was court, there was a court yes. order and we've looped that from my understanding the our attorneys have looped that into the 2022 case as well okay so they're together now okay um so whatever he provides to us should include that stuff yes okay yeah address all of the okay. ongoing issues i believe okay thank you have the wetlands issues been teased out of all this documentation like the, the berms aren't in here at all the berm is at the street so that's not within the buffer um, right I just want to make sure that it's it's not coming into that's not for of concern for the board to review it would just be wetland issues right, that's my concern I just want to make sure that it's not in any of this it may reference it but it's not something that you guys have to um, act upon for that that will be Public Works is more involved in that one. So just for everyone's knowledge, there are several issues involved here. Yeah. There's the wetlands issue and then there are others. Um, for, you know, the berms, for example, that's outside of our purview. Again, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. 
Um, he's been cited multiple times for wetland violations, excavating in the wetlands, dredging, all this kind of stuff, and apparently has never done anything about it. <clears throat> so he's coming before us looking for a blessing on what he's already done. And if we tie it to, we'll give you the conditional use permit if you do this. Well, he hasn't done this in the past, so what incentive is there? Well, we're, we're obligated to do what the court tells, tells us to do. I mean, he needs, the court has told him that he needs to request a conditional use permit. The conditional use permit can include a deadline for when things need to be in place. And if they're not in place at that point, then code enforcement can move forward again. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe it ends up back in court, and then it's the judge's decision on how to how to respond. It's yeah, it's it's a slow process and yeah. it can be frustrating. But I mean, we couldn't go and say to him and say, "We'll give you the conditional use permit after you've correct, corrected the items that were already identified." Potentially could, I would think. Yeah, generally that's not how it works we've, we've had after the fact applications before and um, we've requested that the applicant finish the uh, remediation by a certain date yeah. and you know they haven't in, in the past and and it has gone back to, to court and the and monetary penalties and that sort of thing All right. does that answer your question yep. All right, so the applicant's request is to continue. Does anyone have a motion regarding that? Make a motion to continue the request of Michael Davis, et cetera, until the meeting of 8 9. I'll second it. Okay, there's a motion and a second to continue. Any more discussion? Mr. Dodds? No. Not continue? I'm sorry. Say the motion is. No, I'm in agreement to continue it. Okay. Yeah. I, I was confused by how you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Smith Canyon. Yeah. Mr. Rhodes. Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Mr. Breyer. Uh, so that's unanimous, and the motion passes to continue until next month. New business? Any correspondence about new business? Crossley. Um, we did provide for you a draft of the solar ordinance. This is working its way through uh, the planning board right now. And Michelle asked to share this with you all to get any feedback that uh, the Conservation Commission may have regarding the uh, draft at this point. See if you have any feedback, any comments, things you think will work well, don't recommend to. All right, so we'll put that, we'll move on to new business before the commission. Um, it's communication from Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's, so we have a draft of the uh, solar portion of the zoning ordinance. So a couple of comments on this that came up at planning when we first looked at it last month um, and what we kind of distilled out of it. Rooftop residential is pretty much unrestricted. Um, if you can fit it on your roof, it's good. Um, where things started to get some questions was around uh, installations at, at ground level or mounted on posts, kind of like what we've got behind the car wash out here. Um, so concerns popped up around that, around impact on neighbors, uh, the size of the installation uh, for the rack mount type ones. Um, I think we had an installation of that at a uh, condo community down off of, of Maine heading towards the main line. Um, with those, it was around size and generation capacity and when that crossed into being a utility installation, things like that. Um, so if I'm kind of summarizing the, the sentiment that planning had on that rooftop, absolutely okay with installations on the ground. Concerns started coming up when they were large, particularly when they're elevated, when they're impacting neighbor's property. Um, when they're in front 
of a home as opposed to behind so that there's aesthetic impact there. Things along those lines. Thank you. The first thing I'd like to call attention to is on page six, placement of ground mounted solar. And I'm wondering why that's located at the very end because it seems significant. Yeah, it almost looks like a footnote to the table. Yeah. I saw the same thing, was wondering why it was in there. I like what's there. You know, I do, yeah, that was what I was looking for through the whole thing. Yeah, it took me a while. To, to be honest. There was one thing that I thought I so I, I don't don't know the entire context of all of this, but for that same <clears throat> excuse me that same section, you know, and I don't know if this would be an overstep or anything too, but you know, having a plan for uh, vegetation management, um, including invasive species and mo and maybe mowing times, just if you, if we want to consider you know, building some sort of wildlife habitat, um, pollinator habitat or something underneath these, what are gonna be highly disturbed areas uh, where, you know, forest could be removed or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know if we can work that into that section that we ask people to at least consider that. Um, and then, you know, maybe we come up with uh, best management practices or something like that eventually that we can point them towards. I, I believe that it should be more than a consideration. I think it should be mandatory because yeah. you're disturbing the habitat, which is leaving it wide open for invasives. Yeah. And there's good opportunities. I think, I mean, you sent something around recently when, when we first started having a discussion with Packy. Um, I looked into like blue planting blueberries under these for a while. You know, so there's a lot of options out there. and, and um, so yeah, I mean, maybe we could put together BMPs or something they could follow. Or... Dan, am I remembering right that this has to go to <clears throat> council before it finalizes, or does planning have the ability for this too? Um, so planning will ultimately make a recommendation to council. Council is the authority for adopting and changing zoning ordinances. Thank you. I can remember who does that. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely something we could request that get passed up to council. The only other comment or concern that I had, well, the only significant one, was uh, page three, letter G. Um, you know, I I like the idea that, that there could be revenue generated from leasing land, but I would hate to see forests being cleared to put in a solar array panel, and, that, and you see that uh, in other areas. So, um, I don't know if we can put some limits in there on, on what type of lands are used or, um, cause I think the, you know, probably the focus there is, you know, thinking of an abandoned field or something along those lines, but it could also end up with, Hey, there's a nice chunk of forest in an area that could be cleared and, and panels could be put in. So, um, maybe some limits on that could be considered. I agree. Yeah. I think, it's it's great if it's in already disturbed areas, mm -hmm. um, especially already disturbed areas that are not close to the wetlands, because hopefully you know, we want to regain some of that disturbed area near the wetlands. Um, would that be would that have to be contingent on actual zones, um, residential? Industrial, et cetera. Um, so G is specifically talking about city owned land. Um, so okay. it would potentially, depending upon the structure of the use, zoning wouldn't necessarily always come into play because of being, if it's a government use. I think it's, it says privately owned or. So they're talking about for Systems. the ownership okay. of the solar arrays. Okay. So such as the proposal for the one at the um, the landfill. Yeah. Mm. So that would be an example of what that's addressing. Okay. That basically the city is permissible to put solar arrays on city-owned property, and they could enter into a private lease or, or operate it themselves. So we could stipulate for city land. It would 
it'd be independent of um, zoning designations, right? Potentially, yep. So we could have a request in there to prohibit the clearance of established forest or established timber. I may not limit it to forest. Wetland, definitely. Um, well, we've already got a stipulation that it can't be within wetland or within wetland buffer. Right. So I would assume that would include the forested buffer, the full one. It should um, be spelled out, though. Mm -hmm. Is there any other placement that habitat types that you'd be concerned about? I mean, we don't have a whole lot in Somersworth. Yeah. Nothing else jumps to mind. Pine Barrens. <laughs> um, about excluding it from the from the buffer. As as Jeremy Degler pointed out, I, I liked what was uh, written in the on page six. Number three, the, the last bullet, grounded mount, ground mounted solar shall not be allowed within the wetlands buffer, period. Um, I, I take that to mean the 150, 150 feet of setback from the, from the wetland, but that's me. I want to make sure that that's spelled out. Zero to 50 or only the zero, zero or zero to 100? Zero to 150. Like, yeah. yeah, the 150 foot wooded buffer. Yeah. yeah, you like changing that to like all wetland buffers? Uh, I, I think um, officially it's called a setback. Hmm. So I would say buffers and setback. I had a question, and I don't know if it's just because I don't understand something, but when they when it, it's talking about, am I, am I interrupting you? No. Okay. Um, when it's talking about the different types of solar, like whether it's um, agriculture, commercial, large commercial, that kind of stuff, it sounds like it's aimed towards people that are planning on using at least a portion of this solar cre energy created <clears throat> for their own use on the property that where it is what about people that are just specifically trying to make solar farms where it's just going into the grid they're not using any of it themselves on the on a particular property am i just like reading too much into it or does that fit with all these other things i have no reservations about where they're using it um is there no i just wondered how it fit into these categories yeah. um, because it makes reference to use on the place where it is mm -hmm. and if they're not going to use it on the place where it is maybe that should be dropped from the descriptor or something yeah. for example the agricultural verbiage that and there's also the like the commercial um, it just talks about well maybe that would be where the salt war farm would come in is um, <clears throat> Because I think it very bad at the very beginning, community solar. Um, uh, oh, I guess never mind. I guess it didn't categorize it as much as I thought it did when I ran. Well, I think it does under agricultural. I yeah. forget where, but Jeremy, was the intent? I guess it depends on what the intent of the of the language was. Was it that? Um, solar isn't built on agricultural land unless it's used there because of the need so my read on this is that these are the agricultural designations here are ones where the agricultural use of the land is preserved so those get treated differently um, and in those cases it's basically in support of an existing agricultural use of that property so it's generating electricity for that purpose these other ones that get broken down around uh, commercial large commercial industrial utility solar power generation station those are all based on the amount of power that's produced on the site and the land coverage that's involved there um, and there's a lot of intersection with state utility law and with, with whatever source permits there too um, or whoever it's going to be with ever source switches over to somebody else um, so 
there's a lot of points there where there's intersections with other laws on the books. So the intent of, you know, it tacitly, I guess, says that you can't have um, power plugging into the grid from, uh, from an agricultural site. Because we don't want to use agricultural land, use up agricultural land for other purposes, unless that electricity is going toward the functioning of the agricultural land. Yeah, because both of these agricultural ones, the accessory and primary one, um, there's a cap on um, the primary agricultural of one megawatt or five acres of use, and it preserves the primary agriculture use on the site. So when I'm reading this, I'm thinking things like you've got solar panels set up in between crop rows or orchard stations, um, and you're using that power to like for service of the agricultural use of the property. So you're generating you know, water draw for irrigation out of solar on the site as opposed to use of grid power. Um, if it crosses over into commercial use, so it's going over that level or it's no longer in service of the agricultural use of the property, then it becomes a different classification under these rules. Um, I think at the heart of it, what this uh, ordinance is designed to do is to take the different uses of solar that we're seeing crop up here and in other communities out there, classify them, and allow for the treatment of those differently inside Summersworth, as opposed to the situation right now where we've got the limited degree of ordinances that direct this. So things like these large tracker installations that require poured concrete um, and uh, plinths that they're put onto and mainline runs are effectively treated the same as rooftop mounts in terms of ordinances. So this permits the breakup of that and the separate regulation of those kinds of installations. So regarding um, impervious classification, I, I wanted to revisit that because even though the panels themselves and I assume the maximum radius of the panels have to be outside the, the buffers completely. Um, we know that they're going to be conditional use permits requesting the, to put it in the buffer. And I want to make sure that the, the, um, the runoff from, from the panels is different from regular rainfall and uh, may, may change the character of the habitat. So maybe we, if it's within the buffer, that it's considered impervious. As things are written right now, or as things are, are written in this right now, if you're doing anything inside the buffer, you need to conditionally use permit for it mm -hmm. already. So that would get handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, but once you apply for the conditional use permit, they're going to look back here to how it's defined, and if it's defined as imper as pervious, then th there's a different allowance for it within the buffer as uh, for impervious. I mean, I agree, panels aren't impervious in the nature, but they channel runoff yeah, yeah. to a, a point, more of a point source than you'd have if they weren't there. Right. Yep. as well as block yeah, vegetation underneath. Yeah. Did you get that? Um, you don't think they're impervious surface? Um, I, I, I'm hoping that there can be, um, that it can be explicitly called out that if the panels if there's if there's to be a condi conditional use permit ap application, the locate panels within even the the overhang of the panels within mm -hmm. a buffer, that at that point they're considered impervious. Okay. Yep. I'm going to clarify with Michelle too that where if it's calling out that they're not supposed to be within the buffer, if you can still get a CUP to have them in the buffer, or if that negates that allowance. Or if it's better to update then in tandem the wetlands ordinance to put this in the prohibited. Okay. I'm going to clarify with her about that course right. of action. 
but I will, um, if it is still the CUP, let her know that the recommendation would be then for within the wetland air buffer setback area, this would not, we wouldn't classify it as impervious. Okay. But that's your recommendation. Yeah, thanks. Do you have any sense, Scott, of how they control runoff from those? Or Jeremy, have you seen anything where is it directed or is it just there's nothing? You know, it hits it and comes off wherever it comes off. I don't know that we've had ground mount solar more than once or twice actually go in. We approved a request for one up behind the, the Duncans on 108. I don't know if that's actually gone forward. Yeah. Um, they did put one in. Oh, okay, yeah. I I don't end up in that part of the city too often. Um, I don't think that was anywhere near wetlands up there, so we didn't talk about it to any great degree on that one. Um, I think the only other large ground mount that's come up in front of us were the stuff that Packy's done behind his car wash on high. Um, There's no drip edge or anything on those. We had had our. I believe that that, that had been a condition when it went he uh, came on back. the panels themselves. Oh, the panels there, themselves. Yeah, there was crushed stone underneath. Okay, so he came back and had that removed. He did. That's when he added the other one at the car wash. If that's been removed on um, since High Street, he came back before the planning board. It was. I thought we had included that as a condition when planning board. A ridge, your first approval of them, that was a condition of approval. Um, and then he came back to have that condition of approval removed and added one more, at least on Penny Lane. Um, that was 2021. It took a minute to get through. I think he had tried to do, um, that was a few meetings. It was like spring of 2021, I think. I know we'd requested multiples on the site and they got paired back. I thought we had to get the crushed stone in that one too. Originally, remember. yes. Okay. But I don't think there's been other, any other like large rack type mounts going into the city other than the one up behind Duncan's. I know Continental was looking at it, but I don't think they moved forward. Kevin, did you have a follow-up on that question? Uh, not really. I'm going to look around at what I, I hadn't really thought about this before, but it's a difficult situation because you have a panel that's moving and you can't necessarily always direct water a certain way. Um, so I, I'll just look into what other other places have done to to, you know, if there is consideration for that or not, or if it's just it runs off, it runs off where it is. Yeah. I've worked on several large scale projects, and for all of those, it's always just been if it runs off, it runs off. Really? It's just kinda, okay. Yeah, there's been discussions about putting kind of like crushed gravel drip edge along some of it, but mm -hmm. in the end, they just, it's just revegetated and hope for the best. I am anticipating to get their stormwater report um, upcoming and then. Next few weeks, the um, Norway Plains indicated. I can share that with you guys if that would be beneficial. It's for Penny Lane. Yeah, that'd be good. And uh, if there's one coming in for the um, mm -hmm. one up behind Duncan's too, I'd be curious if they've had any hits there because I think that one's a rack type where they're just mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. So if they're getting erosion on that site. Between Duncan and the storage units? Yeah. So when you see the crushed stone, is that crushed stone the entire radius of the panel? Yeah, so uh, on these it was just uh, like the panels wouldn't move. They were just oh, like okay. long lines. Yeah, like along that, just that close edge would just be crushed stone right right at that lip. And yeah. everything else is just huh. agitated. So that's a, that's a much less of an impact than one that's on a pole post that would be spinning. Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be a big footprint of crushed stone. Yeah. 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 That's another point um, that I wanted to touch on. There's a 20 foot limit in here. Mm -hmm. And um, for panels that are vertically fixed, I was thinking that maybe we might want to consider allowing them to be higher. Um, my, I think my peak of my roof is 25 feet. And um, 
as we were talking before about uh, development, higher I think is always better if possible because we can get you can pack more in and um, disturb less land. So I think the concern for residential was around you know shading your neighbor's yard. Yeah, and view. Yeah. Um, but even when you're talking about you know, residential and some of the older parts of the, the city, like mine's an 1890 building. I think my roof peak's like 32 feet, and it's two stories with an attic. So we've got residential that goes up, up well above the 20 that is very normal in the city. So, yeah, particularly in a tracker type array where it's not constant. Could be some nuance there. And there's likely to be new technology coming out that has different designs that may need to go upward. Yeah. Are they allowed to go over that 20? That, that's probably a question for Michelle. Would they be allowed to exceed that 20 foot with a CUP? CUPs are for residential solar. Um, I can clarify if that would if it's dimension wise as well, or if it's just um, use wise. Okay. I wanted to ask whether under system layout on page three, 1933 F2, we could ask that required clearances for maintenance access and access roads and pathways and material makeup surface material makeup could be included more than just access for site for emergency response shall be provided and detailed in the plan yeah because they're going to need access for regular maintenance okay And if that stuff needs to be kept clear, then, like Kevin was saying, you know, if they're if we're looking to get pollinators in there and that sort of thing, that's going to be ruled out. I know one of the things that came up with the Dunkin' Donuts solar array was, um, or for as far as growth management underneath um, arrays, there's our uh, property maintenance code regarding grass. And then there is the fire chief had concern of high growth underneath if it should become a fire hazard and things like that. Mm -hmm. So as long, I think they'd want the pollinators and any vegetation underneath that to be compliant with those, to dance the dance with those two things. Right. Yeah, so I think both of those should be called out, emergency and regular maintenance. I didn't see anywhere in here where I know that uh, Packy was concerned that arrays were being, we were calling them permanent structures. He was of the opinion that they were not. I'd like to see them called permanent structures. I don't see in here that they are. And I think my last thing was um, whether they're 
anything could be done incentive wise for placement on disturbed areas or disincentives other you know to the contrary any ideas on that I don't know if um, it could come in the in the form of a of tax relief or something like that. There's an exemption. Pardon? There's a solar exemption currently. Um, I don't know if we'd have the authority to do something for tax relief. Um, it could have to do with. I'll run up by Michelle and see what kind of ideas she has for that. Okay. Do you remember? Um, by any chance what the height was for those grasses on the fixed solar what the height limit was for fire hazard fire hazard no i don't know where his what his concern was prop i couldn't tell you right now what property maintenance is either okay. anybody's gotten a violation for that i think the request was just that it be held to the same standard as general property maintenance guidelines yeah they're required to basically keep it mown down yeah, yeah um his concern stemmed around like tall dry grasses yeah. and the electrical aspect of it okay um but yeah i couldn't tell you off the top of my head what code compliance requires for if your grass is too tall what they send letters for and also um width how wide does it have to be cut? Further elaboration on that? Um, on the periphery of the of the panels, how how oh, far okay. out? Okay. Okay. Cut. Okay. So like the radius of disturbed vegetation. Right. Okay. Does anybody have any sense is that I mean that's a new array out at Duncan's and it just seems like the fixed position arrays would be f being phased out to ones that can track better but does anybody have any sense of that is this are we gonna be seeing you know the fixed the fixed direction farms as much as directional trackers I just read an article about some technology in Japan that showed pictures of straight vertical arrays. <clears throat> um, I don't know what's behind it or whether. Hmm. The only proposals I've seen in the past couple of years have been larger straight array, okay. large scale. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's very different what we would want to manage in the understory for those then. I think what gets installed is really more of an economic decision like the Duncan site, they had a large expanse of land to drop those flat arrays onto and have the luxury of space that probably becomes a lot more economically viable with what it feels like what Matthew's installed at his sites. He's generally got compact chunks of land he's working with for his businesses. Okay. It's a more intensive use there. So try to have something to do with shadows too. Yeah. Just surrounding trees and buildings. Are we good with that discussion? Yeah. <coughs> uh, it's great to see it being developed, you know. I think yeah. it's really useful. Agreed. Yeah. I appreciate that we were able to look at it. Yeah. I will share your comments with Michelle. All right. When you're ready. Old business easement monitoring. I have nothing to report except that we still need someone to take the reins on that. Just chew on it for a little bit. Um, item B, community wildlife habitat item for the city newsletter that actually went in for the July newsletter. 
see any correspondence regarding regarding old business. Um, I held off reaching out to um, BCM, this is BCM, land law, again, until I got, um, I made sure that I had the, the most current um, deeds and documentation for Mallee Farm. But um, there was an attorney who was willing to talk with me about it. I don't know. Okay. I just asked him whether he knew anyone on the seacoast, and he said that they could handle it, and he would talk with me about it. Um, member items, subcommittee items, and reports. Item one, wildlife management plan for Lily Pond parcel. That's me, and I have no update. Item two, Invasives Plan Subcommittee Report, Dale Smith Kenyon. I sent, um, well, after I, I got the text from Scott, um, I sent an email to Charlotte Thompson at UNH regarding um, a possible invasive management grant. Um, so I'm waiting to hear back from her. And I also, um, touched base with well, let me expand on that um, okay I, I mentioned her name because I, I did the um, Great Bay whatever it was survey email that came out uh, mm -hmm. through cooperative extension and they had mentioned within that survey that they were considering providing grants for implementation of the plan initially as well as you know, and or uh, grants for ongoing maintenance costs so yeah, we may be able to benefit from either of those if they, if they come out with them but they also mentioned that they have professionals who can in the meantime who can help us come up with a plan oh, okay. prioritization um, Charlotte was the spearhead for that stewardship um, survey but Rebecca DiGirolamo, um, I oh. think, is also still our point person. Rebecca's left her position. Oh, has she? Yeah, she's no longer with the state. There, so the not. job is being filled now. I think. So I think I saw it flying. Do you know who the uh, interim forester is? Boy, I do not, or I don't remember. There, there was somebody covering. Um, but I feel like maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I saw the job advertised. So I would assume they'll get somebody in there soon. I can find out, though, who they cover. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, sorry. That's okay. Um, and then I also sent um, an email to Mike Babinski um, with the question about whether or not the compost that's available at Mally Farm is um, sanitized or not. Um, and also who's responsible for clearing and maintaining invasives from city-owned property and clarification about recreational and conservation easements and what about utility easements. So I'm waiting to hear back from him too. And then I do owe, um, you forwarded me that letter a while back um, that I need to follow up on that I lost it in my email. It kind of disappears off the face of the earth if it's not looked at for a period of time. I'll have to go back through that. What was it about? It was um, from, I'll forget her first name, Swallow. Sheila. Yes. Yeah. Yep. About helping out on the subcommittee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Okay, and, and uh, a little bit more regarding the Mallee Farm <coughs> compost. Um, it strikes me that Mallee Farm is maybe overrun more than other areas of the city with bitter, bittersweet, et cetera, because people are bringing their yard waste there. And um, I was just wondering how that collection 
is handled um, and whether uh, there's anything done to restrict um, spreading. And then when residents come and get, uh, get compost or mulch for their yards, whether that's sterilized so it's not spread throughout the city. All right, Mallee Farm Trail Subcommittee report, Kevin Dodds. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I did, I was at the last meeting, but you all approved the report, and I followed up with uh, the group, and they're excited to do it. It seemed like they had a hectic month or so, so they're going to follow, or uh, they're going to reach back out to me. So they're not, they haven't started anything yet, but I think we'll, um, actually, I'll probably uh, email them um, this week to see where they're at. Uh, but they were excited to work with us on it moving forward. Um, they were fine with working within the you know that eight-hour window. They thought that would be plenty of time to provide a solid report. So um, I've written up my notes and sent them to the subcommittee. Um, I hope the subcommittee got them. Did you get a link to a Google Doc? I haven't heard from anybody. You did not. <laughs> I've been I've been having good luck with email, at least to city folks. Um, oh, um, make sure that your city emails go to dot nh dot gov. Is N dot nh gov Summersworth nh dot gov now? Nh dot gov. Okay. Instead of dot com or. I mean, I just go for what what is linked. Um, I don't know if any are stale. Mm -hmm. But so no, you didn't get a, a link at all to a to a Google Doc to to review with the email from me. Okay, uh, I'll go back and look. But anyway, so I have our notes did, too. Did you email him by the link on the summersworth.gov page or? Well, no. I'm. This was. I, this went out to um, the subcommittee members to their so personal, right email. personal email. All right. Yeah, it should have. And Angela should have gotten it, but. Um, uh, I'll follow up with that. So, so anyways, we'll have the notes that we have from that day, and then we'll also have the report coming in, and we can. Um, I think having the report will be really important to have out there for for people to see. Um, so, other than that, I'm just in a holding pattern right now. You know, um, we'll get that report done, and then we can talk about what, where we think we should go with everything. So, that's it. Were there any um, loose ends? that uh, we need to talk about. Angela mentioned something about um, a poll and a access points for the trail or something like that, like location on Indigo Hill Road, old Indigo Hill Road. Like someone was, was checking into whether that was city property or something. <clears throat> On, on which side of the road? It's on the same side as the trail of, as the property. Okay. Yeah, so it's it would see it would we were out there. We thought it would certainly have been Summersworth, but um, I guess it's not. And that that that's relevant because of parking or, yeah. or a potential access spot for you know a couple yeah. cars. And signage. Yeah, yeah. So how far in? How far from the road does Rollinsford extend? You know, according to the spatial data that's available from the city, it, it looks like the the our parcel goes to the road. Um, but there is a little section that, you know, there's a little bit of, of space between the border of our parcel and the road. You know, I mean, you're, you know, I'm looking at this stuff on GIS and, yeah. you know, I mean, you're playing around with lines at that point. But, um, yeah, I mean, it would be, it, it, we'll have to figure that out for sure if we want parking up there, you know. And, and part of the discussion about having parking up there was having an easier access point um, for people who may not want to do as much of the trail or have limited accessibilities. Um, but I think also as that, discussion progressed, um, other consultants didn't really think that was a trail that would be easily accessible. That was too steep, probably, even where it seems that it's not that steep, but it's too steep for a wheelchair access. Um, 
So I think we had two cut-ins like on that road, you know, so it could be possible that, that one of the areas is in ours and one is in Rollinsford, you know, so there's, there's actually two points that could be potential small parking there. So if that's not um, a potential point of access, um, would we want to block that off? I mean, I, I, you know, I think, I think there's probably room to talk to Rollins for it too, you know, because there's the connecting property. Um, I always forget the name of the trail across the street from it, that property, the Scout Scoutons. Yeah. yeah. So I think that would be kind of the first place to go. And then, yeah, <laughs> then we would have to probably manage that. Um, but if it's not ADA accept, uh, accessible, then maybe that doesn't matter. I mean, right. You know, I mean, it would be nice to have a second, you know, location in, but I, I, I thought that that maybe we could do something there and, and they thought the only way we could do something accessible uh, or more accessible for folks was to cut in a new trail, like kind of at that area, but go straight back into the forest and do like a smaller loop. But that's very limited because you have a couple, there's a couple gullies going down that too. So, um, so yeah. So the deed should be clear enough to call out that the parcel ends at Old Indigo Hill Road or something like that, I would assume. Got the deed here, so. Say that again? I didn't catch the beginning of what you said. The deed, the Mallee Farm deed, mm -hmm. should point out where the land ends. Okay. And uh, I would assume that Old Indigo Hill Road would be a boundary, but I, I don't know. Yeah, but it was a surprise that Doug pulled that, <laughs> that 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 pole was on Rollinsford. So. That what? Did the pole say that it was Rollinsford? Is that what you're? No, what you're the um, EverSource database. Oh, okay. Lists the town or municipality. That may be incorrect. It could be. Um, I was. I just pulled it up on. Um, Google a minute ago, and there's parts, if you get it really, really close, there's parts where Old Indigo Hill Road goes right into Mallee Farm, but a bulk, the bulk of it is, appears to be in Ron, Rollinsford, um, that, are, that the Mallee Farm land does not go up to the road. Okay. So, but in one particular point it does, it overlaps the road. Well, we can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think even even with the decent um, GPS out there, uh, we could get a better sense of, of boundaries. Um, but I, I think, I, you know, hopefully it doesn't even really matter right. um, that we can just, you know, talk to when we get to that place. If we decide we want that access, we approach Rollinsford and then uh, go from there. Um, so ye, that, I think that's it really for me. I'm, I'm going to, like I said, I'll follow up with them and we'll, and we'll get a timeline for the report. Maybe I can see if we can get it by, um, I think when I originally spoke to them, I was saying if we could get it in the fall, um, you know, by September. So we're now, <laughs> that's only one or two meetings away. So, uh, that's what I'll shoot for if that, if that works for everyone is to get that by September. Sure. It's the September meeting. So. Thanks. Yeah. Any other comments or questions on that? All right. Um, item four, exploration of formal conservation of Mallee Farm City Parcel. And um, I already covered that regarding the uh, BCM land law. Item five, city tree GPS inventory project, um, the online mapping of uh, City trees. I know Doug reached out to Jackson um, and you spoke with him from SRPC. Uh, I didn't know if you wanted to relay your guys' conversation. I have limited for um, my communication with Jackson yeah, about no, it. I can cover it <clears throat> if my voice keeps up. Um, I talked to Jackson last Friday video, uh, on a video call. Can you just say who Jackson is? Uh, Jackson Rand. He's the. He's a GIS planner. GIS planner. With or, SRPC. Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, just discussing uh, that we were interested in a tree street inventory that was brought up at the April or May meeting. Um, 
We talked about the database that he developed for Dover, which is basically, <clears throat> excuse me, what we want to do, I would assume, uh, as well as the, um, he built a database for them. He also built an application that could be downloaded to a phone or a tablet to do the actual survey. Once that survey is done, they download the information into the GIS system and create the dashboard, so to speak. Uh, there is a uh, dashboard for the city of Dover that you can go into, look at it. It's quite a bit of information on there, in different layers you can uh, chisel down to, you know, damage trees, trees, you know, uh, various items. Uh, he said that he could do the same, basically clone the system from the city of Somersworth. Uh, I asked him if the data elements on the survey had to remain the same as what was used, and he said no, you can modify the survey if you want to add stuff or, or whatever. Uh, the survey for Dover contains, I think, 22 different elements that are inventoried at each tree. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we talked about was the actual inventory, how it's done. And there's basically three ways it can be done. The SRPC can do it. The SRPC can do it along with city members and volunteers. Or it can be done by uh, the city of Summersworth and volunteers. Uh, if they do it, if the SRPC does it, I believe he said it was about $120 a day per person, I think it's per person. Um, so How long did Dover's project go? Uh, I honestly, I didn't ask him that. Um, I know based on the dashboard, they surveyed somewhere between 300 and 400 trees. And he said it takes about 20 minutes per tree. So um, at that point, I said, well, you know, where do we go? Well, how do we start this process? And I guess, first of all, I don't know if the, pro if the initiative has been approved by the planning board or the city council or whoever it has to be done or through us. <coughs> Bless you. Bless you. Um, I would think that would need to be done. He said we need, would need to determine what geographic areas we wanted built into this base. So we'd have to provide him with specific geographic data. Um, it depends on whether you want to do just trees, if you want to do schools, parks, cemeteries, you'd have to give all of that information to him to build it in. Uh, yeah, I noticed that um, the historic uh, district has a dashboard on SRPC as well, similar to the Dover Tree dashboard. The storybook? The historical district? Their storybook part. Storybook, is that what it's called? I think so. I think that's what, potentially. Or I'm off base entirely. I don't, I don't know. There was a on. project that Michelle worked on with the historic district in Stratford Regional Planning. Um, um, it was a storybook map, basically, and pulling up different parcels and things like that, if that's what right, you Right, yeah, you can hover over a building. And yep, it would, yep. It's a story map. Yeah. Yeah, because you can pull, you can make those right off of the, the software that Doug's talking about. The app that takes all this data in, it's really easy to produce something. Do you know? Does anybody know? Do we have? I think this came up when I first started, but I don't remember if we had an answer. Um, is there any type of? Um, I know that there's not a database that has a has a lot of information about city trees, but do we know the location of city trees? So st like street trees, if somebody's going down a sidewalk, is there a database that exists that says, you know, this is a city tree, this is not? No, okay. I think that would have to be assumed by right of way. It's, it's yeah, so okay, yeah. I mean, that's, that was one of my questions was how do you, how do you determine what's, what belongs to the city and what doesn't? Yeah. You know, is it right of way? Is it, and it's, it's easy to identify the trees out on the street here. They're in the middle of the sidewalk, so. Right. But, you know, something that's five feet off the edge of pavement, is it us or? Um, 
getting back to the data, once the geographic location or geographic data is determined, you said you can actually email that to him in a, or, or put it in an email to him to be built in. Once the, the base is built with all the data, it's turned over to the city to manage. And I said, well, what happens if after the fact you find something else you want to build into it? And he said, they can do it, but I think they only do it once a year. But he said, whoever's going to manage the database for the city should be able to do it. Yeah. It's not that difficult. So they wouldn't house the data. The, the data would be collected using their apps. It would go into their database, and then they would transfer that database to the city. That's the impression I got. And then the city, do we, does the city have a GIS person? There used to be one listed, but yes. Okay. Hmm. Shell said. We'll work together. Yeah, we have some access to it. Yeah. SRPC does a lot for us too, for layers and things like that. Yes, as far as cost uh, for the whole project, not the whole project, if we did our own surveys and didn't involve SRPC, just them doing the database and taking the survey data and updating the base. He said, you're probably looking at between one and 2,000. Yeah, I, I think um, we'd be hard pressed to find volunteers um, and, and maybe even staff. So it might be our best bet to go with SRPC. If, well, if that were the case, we'd have to find out what trees, how many trees we're talking <coughs> to be able to price it out. Scott, I know the city's, there's a 50-plus a walking club starting up. I'm wondering if we could leverage groups like that to potentially do some of this. Possibly. You could, you could also run it by A.J. Dupair, the urban forester, who's done a lot of work with Mike Babinski on tree planting in the city. He did a walk with... Um, did you go on that walk with the Conservation Commission, and AJ? Um, or with the Valley Club? No, it was downtown. Maybe it was um, no, Sustainability Committee. Um, anyway, he's he's aware of some of the trees in the city. I, I don't know to what extent. I mean, so they're, so they're asking you that so that they, they want an estimate of the number of trees that, that we would want mapped and, and assessed. Well, I think you would have to provide them with something in order to get an idea of what this is going to cost. If it's, if it's $120 a day for two people uh, at 20 minutes a tree, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you'd have to do the math to see, you know, what this is going to run. I might run it by AJ and Mike. Maybe they could give you an estimate. Um, Back on the napkin estimate. Another potential source here. Do, do any of us have any connections with scouting groups in the area? Because this kind of screams Eagle Scout project. I don't. Um, I agree. I mean, it does seem like. I mean, you, you've just thrown out two, <laughs> two yeah. kind of options, and um, I I don't know. I mean, granted, I mean, I do stuff like this, but um, I would think there'd be a lot of interest and. I, you know, it'd be cool if you could tie, and, and maybe this is a question to ask them, can you tie the iNaturalist app into this for IDs and stuff, too, so that you have um, somebody, you know, that would broaden who could do the who could do the surveys. You'd have more information at your hands. So you could do tree IDs, you know. Um, it probably, there's probably no way to link them, but that's okay. I mean, you'd have those apps, and that could tie into Scott to your, you know, you've pushed that um, in a couple different directions. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't know how you get a, how you really get an estimate of trees without doing the survey. So I wonder if you can do an area, you know, say, look, we want, we have five chunks of summer's worth that we want to do surveys on can we do two and you know we can go out and even look at those and see what we think of the abundance of trees you know what i mean to get some sense of it because um it is it is it is more difficult than you expect about trees on whose property they are and if they're on city we ran into this 
in Worcester, Massachusetts, doing surveys for uh, an exotic insect, and um, there's always weird stuff, you know, and so, which is okay for something like this. Who cares, really, if you take an extra tree, you know? I mean, it, it comes into play when you start using that information for planting, um, you know, replanting and replacing trees and all, but um, I, I don't know. I think, you know, the only way we could do it is is a lot of, like, data assessment and pulling in <laughs> you know, property lines that might be dicey anyways, looking at, at aerial photos and trying to count the number of trees and, and who wants to do that, you know. Or, or starting with trees that are on land that are clear-cut, city-owned. Yeah. 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 Parks. Yeah. Park schools. Yeah. Yeah, and that. You know, and having the cemetery done and places like that would be awesome too. You know, those have unique resources often. So, um, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the place to start. You and, know, and, and the cemeteries are prone to invasives. Absolutely. You know, and and they're diverse, so you get so. I maybe that's it. You know, maybe you pick maybe we pick a few properties and go out and try to get a count for them and see how it goes. But I, I do like Jeremy's idea. I mean, if, if we could, I mean, I would go out and do some of this. Um, and I think there's probably other people that would too. And then this, the like Boy Scouts or something like that. High school science classes. Yeah. yeah. I know the local Lions Club has worked with a number of Boy Scouts on Eagle Scout projects. So they may be a connection to that group as well. Um, six trees were just planted at Idlehurst. I don't know if you were aware of that. Um, they had the they had the kids help out digging and pretty cool. That will count toward our Tree City USA uh, membership. But it would be nice to know what's there because um, the original plantings really got hacked up with um, you know the, the plow and salt and a lot of them were planted where they shouldn't have been. You know, in in, uh, in the parking lot where the, you know there's too much soil soil compaction and that kind of thing. So it would be nice to characterize what we have, to know where to focus our efforts. And I think I, I looked at that Dover page a, a long time ago, but I think that's part of the the 22 variables or something, right, is soil or root compaction, um, damage at the base of trees and things like that, and, and that's all helpful to have. Yeah, the other, the other item that I was seeing on there is they have the type of tree, then they have the genus, they have the species, and I mean, do we need that level of detail? Yes. Yeah, I, I think, because see, one of the benefits of doing this, right, is you get you get that overall inventory of what the city has right now, and, and let's say it's 90% maple. That's a problem if you have an invasive species comes through. And so there's ratios of genera that you really want to have so, so that you have a more resilient urban forest. And that's what we would want to kind of use that data to move so that we could provide guidance for replanting when a city tree goes down. So you'd replace... Like if we have 50% red maple, you know, you'd start moving some of those. If as those red maple die, you would start increasing diversity or in that in that area. So it's really useful. As far as inventorying, <clears throat> it almost sounds like you would either need a botanist or a forester or somebody who could actually identify those trees. I. Uh, it's a, a tool called a, a dichotomous key. Basically, it's just a, does what you're looking at have this kind of leaf or this kind of leaf? Are the buds on the same side or different sides? Just easy to identify markers on, on that if, one. If it's, then, it's like a... Yeah. Uh, okay. It's choose your own adventure for tree identification, basically. Yeah. And I think, too, I you know, we I, the some of the apps would help with that, but also... You know, it, if somebody's out with those surveys and they can say, oh, that's a maple, but they don't know if it's a silver or sugar or red or whatever, that's okay. That goes in as a maple. And then somebody who is better with trees can go out and then, you know, add to that data set. So 
I, you know, you wouldn't want people out there who didn't know anything, but the, the dichotomous key is the way, right? You can break them out and get to that genus pretty easily with that. And There's even apps out now that are pretty much mistake proof. You just take a picture of the tree you're dealing with and it'll kick back and say, oh, that's a red maple. So. Which limits time though too, right? Like, yeah. so they're, they're less useful for buds, but um, you know, if there's no huge rush, you maybe get something going in early, you know, late in the summer, early in the fall, and then figure out what's, you know, work out some of the kinks and then be ready for the spring. Yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure that we're not building a stairway to nowhere. So I think <laughs> we, we should have some idea of what we're going to do with the data. Um, we are the tree board, so maybe we should come up with a, I don't know, a regular maintenance schedule or... The two things that jump out at me are, Kevin, you had mentioned DPW or when they're dealing with replanting city-owned trees, they can shift what species they're putting in based on what we've got in the city. This is also something that could be useful for just landowners in the city. If they're looking to plant, if they're looking to harvest what they put back in in its place we can give some give them some direction on here's what's going to actually not be susceptible to invasives here's what would help the, the city if you could put this in so those that, two points kind of jump out i think that's a really good point right that you it would be broader than just the city trees you know so if, if an adjacent property owner wanted to put in wanted to replant five trees we could look at the city data and say, ah, you know, there's already a lot of, um, well, there wouldn't be ash, but maple. I keep going back to maple. You know, there's a lot of maple there, so, you know, let's think about planting something else. Um, the other, you know, we use it, uh, we use things like this for exotic species surveys, you know, to, to specifically target trees so that inventory becomes really important for that, too. Um, allows you to go right out to the ash or the maple or whatever. So those are three things right there that we would want to use it for. So it'd be it'd be used as a, a reference. Mm-hmm. Yep. But not actively used for. And also, when we're dealing with commercial projects on planning, they're required to submit landscape plans as part of that. Um, I've kind of become known as the one who always yells at people when they put in honey locust. Um, <laughs> But there's other examples in there, too. We can update the recommended planting lists for commercial properties. Um, if we've got a preponderance of red maple, which constantly comes up in the city, we can strike that or discourage it and encourage people to put in other natives. And we've seen an uptick in hickory that people are putting in, which is good to see. There's other species that if we can identify what we don't have, we can try to get some of that in on commercial use. Well, so the city puts in a fair amount of money to, uh, to plant trees in the, in the school. Uh, the SAU puts in money for it as well. And I think part of the problem with any, any city project is that you need to plan it on the back end for keeping it up. Um, so that's, that's what happened with a lot of the trees at, at Idlehurst. They, they just went by the wayside. and. Uh, some of them probably should have been taken out and maybe replaced, um, but they also needed, you know, others needed to, to have more mulch put down or um, you know, keep kids away from them or what, whatever it happened to be. But the people who were in charge of maintaining them, uh, my understanding is that that dropped out of the budget. So, how can we fill that sort of gap that, so that we're not spending money on trees that we're just allowing to die? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't, I was just assuming that that was a part of their sort of rotation of tasks you know you plant and you keep it up but if they're if they're saying that they're running out of money to do that then that's yeah i mean it screams of you know volunteer project but that's also you know a lot to ask of folks over a couple years yeah i'm thinking maybe 
at the least, you know, if there's even if there's no one to do it, that maybe that sort of thing is scheduled and codified. Mm -hmm. And we can spit out a management plan based on species from this list. Maybe this could be the genesis of an adopt a tree, kind of like the adopt a spot initiatives that are out there too. Get people to take on management of a tree if the city can't pay for it or the schools can't pay for it, then you can ask people to volunteer for it and tell them what they need to do. What's a reasonable um, time period for reevaluation of a, a tree? So once we had the database set, when you would yeah, then go back planted, out? How often should you check in on it for health? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, so I don't, I, I've not done much of that. I would assume, you know, you, you plant in the fall, you'd go revisit in the, you know, early summer, um, probably another check on it later in the summer. Uh, but I don't know how many years, you know, we can find all of that out. Um, yeah, or maybe it's like, you know, and, and I was thinking sort of individual tree, but what Jeremy just mentioned is, you know, maybe it's like a neighborhood watch type thing <laughs> almost too. If you, and I cert certainly some neighborhoods would probably be more interested than others, but, um, you know, you have like a, uh, not a tree warden, but something along those lines, if we could build something like that with the public where, you know, their neighborhood's trees they're checking in on or something. It's not a huge ask of somebody, and it's directly related to their property and their, you know, area. So, but yeah, we could. I could find all of that, you know, like what is the maintenance schedule? It's a great question because you know I don't really know. What if we, as a group, do um, periodic triage of the damaged ones and um, mm -hmm. and recommend which ones ought to be focused by Public Works or whomever? Yeah, and what it and if it's a goner, what it should be replaced with, right. and yeah. Well, I was just thinking what I could do <clears throat> is possibly get a hold of somebody in the city of Dover that was on the flip side of their project, yeah, find definitely. out how they manage it, who manages it, how they determine what city and what isn't. Um, get whatever information we can from them. Good stuff. Thanks, Doug. Well, I guess that goes back to my original question. Is this an approved project, or is this just something in the um, pending approval? Uh, as long as there's no money involved, <laughs> it's just a uh, yeah or an A. Um, yep. if, it, if it requires money, then we just have to vote on it, and it comes out of our oh, okay. fund. What I heard tonight was that you were doing all of it. You were going to inventory the trees. You were going to work with them. So it hey, seems I, like I, a good I, volunteer I will opportunity. Do some of the surveys, I'd you know, <laughs> learn whatever I can. You seem capable. You were very good at figuring out that telephone pole. <laughs> After 49 years, I should be able to. <laughs> order business is any other old business that may come before the Commission um, Jeremy Degler had asked um, with regard to the, the Oaks whether there were any plans to follow up on um, the I don't know if you're talking about the tree removal uh, project or in general just in general and the tree removal project, all the above. Yeah. It's just we had so many concerns about that site. Thought it might be all right, you know. Yeah, it, it seems like a good idea to me, and maybe we could. I mean, it's not an easement, but we could put it on the schedule, so we do a yearly site visit. Yeah, I, I actually took a, ro a ride in there two or three weeks ago, <clears throat> just to find out if, in fact, they had done any of the cutting. And it, it didn't appear that they have. I mean, you can't really see that far into the course, but 
Yeah, well, they're they're going to cut on the road as well. Yeah, I think you would have noticed if yeah, I didn't they see had. That. So. Yeah, that's a pretty extensive plan. So I thought that was a good idea. And we need to walk the trail, uh, the ad hoc trail uh, at the Ruel property in Sunningdale to see whether that signage has been removed or changed and whether the trails have been properly closed because we had all that trail damage in the, uh, in the wetlands there. So I'll follow up with the state on that and then let you guys know if anybody wants to attend we can go out there. Okay. Uh, we don't have a treasurer's report. I have one more thing just to share with you guys. Yes. Um, I think I mentioned last month that we had ordered wetland buffer signs. Uh, the signs haven't come in, but I did bring the spec to share with you guys. So I can pass. Oh, thanks, John. So they'll be um, available at our office for at the cost. For, um, applicants will have to purchase them and then install them on sites. Cool. Oh, and uh, about signage, I also need to go through the, the easements to find out which ones require, well, prohibit vehicular or pedestrian traffic so that we can put the required signs out. That would be a big project. Anything else? Motion? Like a motion to adjourn? All right, there's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes and the meeting is adjourned at 732. Please turn your mics off.